Association of University Women, AAUW. Tonight, we have three of the candidates for the Sheboygan Area School Board. Christopher Domogoski, Mary Lynn Donahue, and Mark Mansell. Our moderator tonight is Mary Jo Mabrierty. Mary Jo has over four decades of experience in not-for-profit management and fundraising, and she was the Chief Development Officer at the John Michael Kohler Art Center at the time of her retirement. She also has many years of community service, including the Board of Directors at the Sheboygan County YMCA and the American Civil Liberties uh, Union of Wisconsin. She is a longtime member of the American Association of University Women, and she has moderated several earlier candidate forums. Please welcome Mary Jo. Thank you, Julie, and thank you all for being here. Um, we're going to start tonight uh, by having each of the candidates make a three-minute statement. And I'll tell you what we want you to answer in that statement. Um, when I tell you we're gonna, this is three minutes each, we are gonna start with Mr. Domogolsky, then uh, Ms. Donahue, then Mr. Mansell, and we will re alternate alphabetically who goes first in the following questions. In your statement, could you please tell us what are your primary qualifications to be a school board member? And what is the one best thing you can contribute to the Sheboygan Area School District? Mr. Domogolsky. So I'm Chris Domogolsky. Um, I grew up in, in a family with six children and really part of um, the reason that I'm running for school board has to do with that. So uh, my mother was an elementary school teacher as I grew up, and my father taught um, at the technical college for more than 20 years. Um, I followed through with that, th and um, while I was still in Milwaukee, I taught at both Gateway and Fox Valley Technical College and in the Milwaukee Police Academy, so I have some experience teaching myself, but really, really some foundational um, impacts, I would say, in that um, it was impressed on me very strongly that, that buildings blocks that we got through education really was our pathway to success. And so I believe that that is very, very important. And I would say that I think it's important to understand too that two of my sisters are elementary school teachers at MPS. So I have um, a lot of experience with that. Um, I've raised five children, four of which um, have Grad, three have graduated from Sheboygan Area School District and one's currently uh, a senior at North High School. Um, I'm also familiar with the schools from my employment. I've been in law enforcement for the past 30 years. Um, the last 12 plus years I've spent um, employed as the Chief of Police for the City of Sheboygan. And so I think um, from that I have some unique perspectives on some of the issues that we face um, as a community and how they show up in the schools and some of the success that we can have um, in taking that on. And from that, what I'm gonna say is one of the biggest issues that we have is that the schools are part of a larger system and if that system is siloed and um, the agencies and um, people that make up that system, if they're not talking and sharing information, we don't have the success that we normally do. So I think it's very important um, that, that we do that. And I have a lot of experience um, from working as the chairman of the State Law Enforcement Standards Board and on other nonprofit boards um, of making sure that we're listening and getting input from everybody that's involved and in aligning everybody and moving them um, in the same direction. I've also spent time um, as a volunteer coach for Say So, been involved as a mentor through Big Brothers and Big Sisters, and been in the schools as a lunch buddy. And then lastly, uh, for the past um, 10 years, I've been a member of uh, Fight Crimes Invest in Kids, which is uh, um, one of five groups um, that make up um, a stronger America, um, and as part of that, I've spent the last two legislative sessions um, lobbying in Madison um, for support for early childhood education and quality child care, because I understand that the interventions that we make early in life really do make a difference long term. Ms. Donahue. 
Thank you. My name is Mary Lynn Donahue, and I'm running for an open seat on the Sheboygan Area School District's Board of Education. To set the record straight, the contest is between me and Chris Domolgoski. Mark here is unchallenged, what many incumbents wish for, and, and, and Mark is a non-city seat, and, and so the contest uh, that, that people will be voting on to make a choice is between me and Chris. Well, I grew up here in Sheboygan. Uh, I graduated from St. Clement's School and graduated from North High School. And like a lot of children, I couldn't wait to leave. I, and I left for a while. I uh, went to school uh, for a very long time. I worked hard. I traveled, which was great fun. And then I came back to Sheboygan in 1981, and it was the best move I ever made in my life. Uh, I came back as a lawyer, a legal services lawyer, uh, representing low-income people in uh, civil matters. And then I um, met and married this magnificent man who's in the audience somewhere, Timothy, oh, <laughs> Timothy, of course he's hiding, uh, Tim Van Akron, and we have two wonderful children, Michael and uh, John Flanagan. Uh, we are all graduates of Sheboygan Public Schools. Uh, Tim is a graduate of South High, so it's a little hard for me, but you know we've, we've made a, a, a compromise and, and we're all pretty happy about it. Um, uh, like Chris, I've been a student and also a teacher at LTC uh, in very interesting law schools in Bulgaria, Lithuania, and Poland, teaching short courses. I did not make it to Ukraine, uh, but uh, I have a sense, just a sense of the horrible things that are happening there, as, as I'm sure we all do. So service to the community has been a key part of my life. Um, the, the community gave me so much, and it was my way of giving back. I was on the school board uh, previously. Uh, I served uh, on the Sheboygan Common Council, sitting down there uh, for nine years, uh, and uh, on the Police and Fire Commission. Um, learning how to work as a government person, as a government official, really gives you a sense of how you need to learn to work with people, listen, and weigh competing views and competing values. I've also done uh, an incredible amount of uh, uh, local board service, the uh, Sheboygan County Head Start, the Public Education Foundation, the Arts Center, uh, the Sheboygan Symphony, First Congregational Church, you name it. All of these organizations have made my life so rich and, and I want to give back. The one best thing about me, I would say, is I am a problem solver. In all the time, and all the roles that I've had, I have learned to solve problems, and I think that's one of the key strengths I bring to the race. Mr. Mansell. Hi, I'm Mark Mansell. Um, I guess a little bit of my background is I grew up in central Wisconsin, Wisconsin Rapids, Stevens Point. I graduated from St in Stevens Point uh, Senior High School. I went on to college at UW Oshkosh. Uh, then got hired here in Sheboygan, and I've been here for the last 33 years, and I essentially have no more ties to central Wisconsin, so I consider myself a Sheboyganite, even though it's only been for 33 years. Um, I guess some of my primary qualifications that I've always hung my hat on is that I'm, a fa I'm the father of four children, all of which have attended their entire school careers uh, in the Sheboygan Area School District. My last one is a sophomore in, at North currently, uh, but then I balance that with having been, been a property owner during all those years also, so I can balance the need for a quality education, but yet at a responsible price. So I think that's a, a key component of one of my qualifications. Um, I think the second portion of, was, what do I, the primary thing that I bring? What is the one best thing that you can contribute to the district? Well, I guess I would consider, uh, I've been on the school board for 15 years. I guess the primary thing that I would bring would be leadership and experience on the board. Uh, I'm currently the uh, clerk on the board. I've served as the vice president on a couple of occasions. I chair the uh, Human Resources Committee currently and have done that, that in the past. I'm a vice chair. I've been the vice chair in uh, curriculum and instruction, and I've been the vice chair on finance. And I've also served on the facilities and recreation uh, committee, which are our four committees. So I know how this board operates, I know how the district operates, 
And in the upcoming years, we, we currently have two essentially brand new board members, and we're expecting two more members, and so we'll have four members out of the nine that will have essentially no more than a year of experience. So the leadership in transitioning these new members and to continue to function at the high function that we do. I've always been impressed by the way the school board operates here. It doesn't seem to be like any other government entity. There's differences of opinions, but there's always consensus and support between our members. And I think that's a key ingredient in keeping the continuity of, of all of the past members and current members of this board and the way it operates. Thank you. Uh, school board candidate Susan Hine uh, had a class tonight and is not able to be with us in person, and I have been asked to read this on Susan's behalf. Susan Hine has lived in Sheboygan for most of her life. Susan earned her BA teaching degree from Lakeland College, now university, master's counseling degree from Marquette University, and a doctorate in higher education organizational leadership from the University of Southern Florida, NOVA. She is currently employed as a clinical therapist at Counseling Center of Sheboygan. Susan's family and her husband Daniel's family, including their children, are all Sheboygan Area School District graduates. They are very proud of the district and the accomplishments their children have achieved due to the education they have received. Susan also volunteers her time with the Sheboygan Service Club and Diploma Dash with the Sheboygan Public Education Foundation. Quote, I serve on the school board to support the district as it continues to engage all children in educational opportunities and preparation for their future. Quote, I am proud to be a member of the school board and of the commitment of my fellow school board members to provide excellent education to the district community. I am especially proud of our students, teachers, administrators, and all staff members. I will remind the candidates of their three minute limits on the questions and we will now proceed. And this is the first of several two part questions. And we'll start this one with Ms. Donahue. What are the most important challenges facing the district in its responsibility for the education of our youth? And what are your priorities for meeting those challenges? We've just come through a seismic time in our lives in the community and in the nation and in the world uh, because of the pandemic. The pandemic has truly been a, uh, a world changer. It has turned our world upside down and it's certainly turned the school district upside down. Our students came back uh, in the 2021 school year and our teachers and staff and parents are working very, very hard to bring them back to where they were. I call it the new normal, but the new normal has to be even better than the old normal. Students coming back have spent uh, a long period of time away from a traditional school structure. They have missed their friends. They have missed their community. And as they come back into the school district, we have special challenges to help them regain their academic skills and to meet the fairly significant mental health needs that students have. So I think those are extremely significant challenges, but make no mistake, public education has always been challenging. There's, um, it is the foundation of our democracy and yet it brings in everyone and has many, many different masters to answer to. So within that realm of complexity and difficulty, I think priorities need to be, one, bringing our kids back to uh, the standards academic levels that they had been previously. Um, the district's report card indicates that there has been some slippage. Number two, I would say that we need to address the needs of all of our students. Remarkably, for someone like me who grew up in Sheboygan, 52% of our students are students of color. We are a majority minority school district, or should I say that the other way around? But um, that is another huge change, and we have a, a loving 
and inclusive responsibility to all of those kids. And so we need to work really, really hard to ensure we have enough teachers, enough time, enough parental involvement, enough mental health uh, resources, counselors, programs, to really bring us back together into a, uh, a cohesive and highly functioning school district, which I think we are even now, but uh, there's, we can only go up. Mr. Mansell. Could you please repeat the question? Yes. What are the most important challenges facing the district in its responsibility for the education of our youth, and what are your priorities for meeting these challenges? Well, we've got uh, several priorities. Mary Beth hit on the primary one, and that is uh, getting student achievement back up to the levels they were before and trying to continue to improve upon that. Uh, but as far as issues that are going to be going on, uh, there's proposals to uh, sell the property on the east side of Taylor Drive currently and to be able to determine if we move forward with that and how that progresses unlike a previous property sale we certainly would like to see this be uh, uh, go a little bit smoother than that um, we're on the brink of needing new middle schools and that's going to be a significant uh, amount of money and Currently, there's a committee, a citizen committee looking into the options, and we're waiting for that to finish that process to determine how we move forward on replacing urban and replacing Farnsworth Middle Schools. Um, there's no announcement made, but I would expect that the uh, superintendent is going to retire in the next few years, and the most important job that the school board can do is hiring a superintendent. So those are significant things. Some of the other things that we're facing is just uh, a lack of teachers and people going into the teaching profession. So being able to attract and retain teachers, uh, quality teachers to provide the quality education to our, our kids is a, a significant uh, challenge right now. Uh, we're also losing students, just the demographics, there's fewer kids. So fewer kids means we're getting less money in state aids. So we got to try to make ends meet that way. We also are facing a challenge with the uh, vouchers going to private schools, which was about, I believe, four and a half million dollars or four point three million dollars this year, which we then uh, were allowed to tax to make that money up. But that's additional tax property taxes on everyone. Um, I would say that the way the board operates and that I would see it is that we need to provide the resources and the support and the direction to the administration and to the teachers and the staff to be able to provide this education so that they know they're supported by their board and the community, you know, that we're just kind of the go between between the community and the administration in order to make all these things happen. Thank you. Mr. Delmogoski. Um, so I think the other candidates did a really good job of laying out the issues uh, ahead of us. I think uh, the biggest challenges um, are, are just what they said. It's dealing with um, the pandemic and the impacts that that has already had um, on our kids and on our community. Um, and that shows up not only in the achievement level as been mentioned, but, but also in um, their social and emotional well-being. Um, and so the school um, or the school district r really has a, a bigger um, challenge other than just educating them. It's really making sure that, that they're well um, from a holistic um, point of view. Um, and so as it's been mentioned, having um, the services in place and, and delivering the training to the right people and making sure, like I said before, that all the other system partners are engaged and aligned so that we're using the best of all the resources in the community, I, I think is extremely important. And so that means having ESPERT in place and having a CAT team at, at Health and Human Services that works with the school district. Um, it, it means making sure that the programs that we have set up so when the police um, go to a house and see trauma going on that they can um, deliver a message to the school district so that the teachers know that some kid might be off the next day because of what happened um, in, in his or his or her <coughs> life 
um, the evening before. Um, so all of those things kind of go together. Um, I think one of the big um, priorities needs to be not just getting caught up in today, as Mark kind of mentioned, it's being future looking too, so that um, we have the resources, both the physical resources like buildings and, and things like that, but also the people resources, so teachers and, and counselors and um, treatment staff, um, and also quality leadership in the school district. And then I think the enrollment issue, again, is a, is a big issue. Um, both, both the issue that shrinking enrollments, um, but also the issue that, that Mark mentioned about um, vouchers and the impact can, that can have. And so I think staying focused on really the great things that the school district offers um, and some of the work that passports have, have really done to do things like keep charter schools as part of the district so that there's options and pathways for, for every kid. Um, really it's really really important and then i think um, as we're dealing with with trauma and some of those kids that that really have um, some difficult issues in their life it's making sure that they stay engaged and in school and that might look different for for different kids so it might be going to different schools it might be online but but whatever we can do to keep them and those families engaged thank you uh, we'll start the next question with Mr. Mansell. Would you support additional teaching assistance in classrooms with multiple special needs students? In addition, teaching assistants are currently paid $15 per hour. Would you support raising their pay to $18 or $20 per hour? Well, fortunately, I don't have to ask you to repeat the question. Okay. <laughs> Uh, I don't know that I have enough information based on the question to really be able to address the answer. Uh, am I willing to provide additional teaching assistance to a classroom for special needs kids? Uh, absolutely, yes. If they're needed there, then we should have additional teaching assistance. But I don't, you know, without knowing the need per se, it's hard to jump on board just saying that more more people in that classroom is going to be beneficial or more beneficial. Um, and, the and the same with the uh, increases. We just raised the, uh, the, that pay to $15. Well, I've always been an advocate for our support staff to have higher increases or higher percentage increases than our administrative staff or our teachers because of the inequity between what they receive you know, a, a 2% increase on a $12 an hour job compared to a $80,000 high uh, maxed out teacher are, are two different things. Uh, so, and the uh, the other, I would, I would have to say on, on first blush, I would be supportive of increasing that more, but I would need to balance that against the financial impact and our ability to pay. And we're, you know, if that some, would mean we'd have to cut something else, I need to have the full full picture of that in order to you know approve something like that. But I'm obviously supportive of it. Uh, one of the challenges that we face right now are the increased uh, private sector wages. So, fifteen dollars an hour at in, at the school district may not be enough to really make the ends meet for somebody else that could go walk out the door and work private sector at twenty dollars an hour. So we're in a competitive world. So we try to make uh, the working environment and the reason why they're working for the school district hopefully a little bit more palatable that if they're not making quite as much as in the private sector that they still would prefer to be working in the district but because it's not always all about the money. Mr. Domagoski. So I would um, support the concept but I would agree with Mark that with what Mark said, and part of that is really um, looking at the whole staffing plan for the district and, and determining priorities and needs and determining where that fits in. Um, so um, it could 
you know, that what it could come down to based on, on the budget is, are we adding teaching assistants or are we adding music teachers or are we adding school counselors? And so I think really without looking at the whole big picture and seeing um, where the greatest needs are and then prioritizing that and working from there, it's really kind of hard to answer the question, but I think the general concept is, yeah, we wanna make sure that all the kids have the resources that they need to be successful. Thank you. Ms. Donahue. 18.3% of our students in the Sheboygan Area School District are students with disabilities. It's about one in five students. State funding for students with disabilities has been, let me be frank, a disgrace. We are wildly underfunded for services for our disabled students, and it's a crying shame, it really is. I wholeheartedly support looking for additional teaching assistants. Uh, they are a vital part of a classroom. I've been, I've been in classrooms, I've watched them, and they're not only good for the child who is disabled, but also for all of the students in the classroom. Now we started talking years ago about what a living wage was and it was $15 an hour. That's not even close now, that's not even close. So we need to support uh, adequate and decent wages, not only for our teaching assistants, but for everyone in the school district. Now, how does that happen? How can we take care of that? Well, I suggest that we take it to our state representatives. School funding is still not back at the level it was in 2010, when there was a drastic and dramatic cut to public school funding. More funding was provided this year, but that funding went to taxpayers, nothing wrong with that, but there was zero increase per student in the Sheboygan Area School District. No more money. There's something dramatic, and there may be questions about the school funding formula, so I won't get on my high horse to, to, to too high a degree, but the school funding formula is, is broken and it needs to be taken a look at. Now, the ESSER money, the elementary and secondary school emergency relief money, and we're in our second phase as I understand it, has been really uh, critical. We've been able to hire 11 new teachers. We have four new school uh, uh, counselors. The problem is that that is, and I'm, as Mark and Chris would say, this is not sustainable because that money will be gone in 2024. So we really do need to be putting our thinking hats on, but we have to attach our tongues to our brains and start talking to our legislators about the fact that there, my prejudice here, there's truly nothing more important than the education of all of our students. We just need to be on it. So. $20 an hour, absolutely. More teaching assistance in the district, absolutely. It's going to be one of the things that I am going to work on so hard once, if, if in fact I am elected. Thank you. Uh, we're gonna start the next question with Mr. John Mogalski. The district is currently considering proposals for the purchase and development of the 26 acre vacant property across from the Field of Dreams sports complex on Taylor Drive. How would you like to see that land developed? I would like to see it developed in the best interest of everybody. And so I think there's lots of different stakeholders um, that are involved and really it, I can't give you an answer on that until I hear really what all of the stakeholders have to say and what the different viewpoints are and then really weigh that. And so there's benefits for how that land could be developed that would benefit the school district. There's um, the city that could benefit in many ways um, based on the different developments that go up there. There's neighbors that, that live either across the street or some of them that live essentially on the same parcel directly there. And so I think there's lots and lots of different stakeholders that it's important to hear from. And then part of it really is the development agreement um, as far as what it brings to the tax base. So how, how does it impact just our everyday residents? How much money does it bring into the school district? How much does it bring into city taxpayers? 
So I, I think there's really a lot of different issues to look at. The city has many different needs. It has housing needs and, and um, additional health care needs. And so I think all of those ha have strengths to the proposals, but really until um, as a school board member, until I heard from all of the different constituencies and stakeholders, I, I wouldn't be able to, to give you an answer about what the best use is. Ms. Donahue. Um, I did attend um, a school board meeting where proposals, two proposals were discussed for the parcel of land. Um, the, uh, there was a, a proposal for uh, uh, some senior living. Uh, it did not seem particularly well developed or well thought through. And then there was a very interesting proposal from Freighter Hospital or the Freighter Medical Complex uh, to uh, develop a clinic and small um, uh, non-surgical hospital on site. Uh, the freighter proposal was uh, extremely well developed, uh, very thoughtful, um, would bring a uh, pretty penny, I would say, to the to the school district in terms of, of the sale price. Taxation for hospitals and clinics is kind of complex. Some are taxable, some aren't, but I believe that it is a really it's the highest and best use for that property. Now, there, as Chris said, there are some issues because it borders right along, believe it or not, all of those wonderful houses that our students built. Uh, on, I, I think it's North 27th Street, I may have the, uh, but when I was on the school board long ago, students built these wonderful houses up and down that, uh, the street that's adjoining. How we treat those neighbors um, I think is very important. How they feel about the development of the proposal I think is very important. I do think it's time that that piece be developed. Uh, and, uh, and we all learned a lot from the controversy that arose across the street, both the city and the school district. And I'm pretty confident that the school district is moving forward in a real thoughtful way on it. I don't know what the decision is. Uh, and I, you know, uh, so I am just, from my perspective, listening to those two proposals, I, I clearly think the freighter proposal is, is the most sensible, just based on what I was listening to, not a deep knowledge. Yeah. Mr. Mansell. Well, the, the update is, and I guess what I'm going to be in support of is, is we took action last night to uh, direct the administration of the school district to enter into contract or uh, offer to purchase negotiations with Freighter to move forward on the proposal that they had offered. This is still the infancy stages. There's a zillion hoops to uh, jump through in regards to uh, getting community input. Uh, the city is gonna get to need to get involved to do uh, zoning changes and stuff like that. So this is far, far, far from a done deal. But in, uh, on behalf of the school district, I believe the purchase price was $3, $3 million. So that's a significant amount of income for that property and way above what the other two offers. We had put out a, a request for offer to purchase the property or develop the property. I can't remember that exact, the, the terminology, but we'd received three proposals, two of which were invited to uh, present. Uh, the third one wasn't invited to present. So right now that's where the, the board has moved forward to pursue that. I believe the estimated estimated property tax income would be about three quarters of a million dollars a year. And that's even with the reduced rate because of the hospital beds. Because it's gonna primarily be a, a, a medical facility and then a, a, a adjacent to that, uh, portions of uh, senior housing, including a memory care unit, which is drastically needed for this community. And I'm sure it'll still be uh, filled the capacity and there'll still be need after that. But uh, my opinion, you know, so I, I guess that's where the direction the board gave last night after our, our closed session. And I'm anxious to see how that moves forward. Uh, something needs to be done with that property because there are wetlands on there that continue to expand. And if nothing gets developed on there, it might be a point where it's can't be developed at all. And it wouldn't be much of an asset to the uh, to the district or to the community at that point of just having a swamp land over there, I guess. Thank you. Uh, next question, and we'll start with Ms. Donahue. 
what kind of training should teachers, staff, and administration receive to ensure that all students are treated equally and that all interactions are appropriate for all students? Sometimes we think that if we treat people equally, we are treating people with equality. It's a really tough concept. Um, the I'm, I'm, I'm trying to choose my words carefully because it is, it is such a complex question. So I'm just delighted to be the first to answer it. Um, <laughs> the, um, uh, we need to ground our training and our orientation in the perspective that 52% of our kids are not white. There needs to be a full understanding of the diversity of the school district and the diversity of our community and the diversity of the world and how that impacts how children learn. Teachers need to have appropriate and powerful education to understand how complex and how difficult it can be to, just an example, a friend of mine was a, a librarian at Sheridan School many years ago. Um, a lot of Hispanic kids there and she was talking to them about how they were gonna decorate their mantles for Christmas. And this child looked up at her and said, what's a mantle? Because we don't have mantles. So to understand that culturally, children are different, they come from different backgrounds, they may learn, well, all children learn differently, is, is, is tough. I know that the school district is investing in that kind of training for its staff. And, uh, and the education needs to spread out even beyond that. It needs to spread to parents and to the community to understand that we are a diverse and so enriched by that diversity uh, community. So um, I would say the training needs to be thorough. It needs, it, I'm not aware what is happening now. I will, I will learn, um, but it needs to continue or it needs to be started because that is the name of the game in this community. And it's, to me, it's good news, but we need to work in that direction. Mr. Mansell. Yeah, please uh, repeat the question for me. What kind of training should teachers, staff, and administration receive to ensure that all students are treated equally and that all interactions are appropriate for all students? Well, I guess, I I don't really, I, I guess I'm gonna just come out and say, I think that's a very loaded question. You're making a lot of assumptions there that, that people aren't being, that aren't, that people aren't being treated equally or fairly. Uh, obviously, I think that we all, any kind of training to make all of us better people and how to treat everybody appropriately is appropriate training. And the other half of that is, I don't, you didn't provide any options as far as what training is even available out there. So how I can't make a choice of what training I would support without knowing what the options are. And that would have to be something that I would need to get more information. But I don't think we have, should all assume, I mean, and obviously, all of us are different and all of us have different expectations between whether it's the staff or the children and sometimes you have to treat people differently, but still be cognizant of the differences and being appropriate and fair. I, I get that, but I just don't know. I, I, I think we're making some assumptions there that may not always be there. And I just don't know that that's fair to say that it's not happening because we, you know, I guess they'll just leave it at that. Mr. Domagoski. So I think that, that it's not an easy question to answer because of the even the diversity of our teachers. Um, and when I say diversity, I'm not just talking about race or ethnicity, 
but we're talking age experience and all these other things. So some um, new teachers that have just come, come out of college probably had some dif different curriculum that some more experienced teachers um, might not have had, and so they might need some um, classes that way. I think there's also you know, a teacher that's been in the district for a long time is, might be much more aware of the resources available for both the within the school district and within the community. And so I think there needs to be some base level and then on an individualized um, basis, um, some of that training plan would, would have to go from there. And it would include things um, like training on a base training base level training on trauma so that they recognize um, what's going on with, with some of the kids who have been through traumatic um, experiences, um, the ability to identify that and refer to other resources within the, within the district. Um, I, th I think um, obviously um, some type of cultural awareness or cultural competency or whatever it might might be called depending on where you are and what's available but the district could definitely identify good training um, that way and it's probably things that should be ongoing um, because the community is always changing and so we need to keep up with that but I think really um, there there's a number of different things that teachers need to be aware of um, just like anybody in the community does. And then depending on some of our jobs, there, there's different things. But I, I'm gonna go with that. So I think there's a variety of things, but part of it is recognizing trauma and, and culture and, and how we can impact that and, and be positive with those things. Thank you. With the next question, we're gonna start with Mr. Mansell. A recent accountability report which is required annually by the DPI and currently available on the district website, showed most K-12 schools exceed or meet expectations. Two significantly exceed, and one meets few expectations. How can the district help students close the learning gaps? And how should the district monitor the learning progress of students in schools that do not meet expectations? Well, we're always monitoring that. Um, I think there's and there's uh, significant uh, plans in place right now by our curriculum instruction uh, department for making those improvements and implementing those improvements. Um, there's a lot of collab collaboration between the successful schools and the ones that need improvement more. And obviously it's through uh, testing and I've just got a, drawn a blank on <laughs> evaluate, evaluating the, the children to know where they're at and being able to have a team effort to identify those weaknesses and how to improve them, like through uh, reading interventionists or reading specialists. And there's uh, a lot of development going on right now with uh, in our curriculum and instruction area to identify best practices that are helping those kids the most. And there's a difference between you know, teaching the higher end kids versus the, uh, the kids that are needing to get caught up. So there's a variety of factors that go into that, but I can assure you that the curriculum and instruction department is feverishly working on all that. I mean, we get reports out on that all the time and uh, it's, it's happening. Mr. Domagoski. So I think it's really paying attention to it is the number one thing. And so some of that is already going on. Um, you can see that um, in the reports at the school board meetings. Um, it's making sure that we're developing the resources for those that are lagging behind specific um, things such as Mark talked about, about reading interventionists, but it's also after school programming, um, summer school programming, 
Um, it's understanding that kids are individuals, which I think most of our teachers understand very well, and they have different learning styles, so it's adapting some of the um, teaching to those individual learning styles and making sure that the resources are there and available, and I think it's making sure that, that kids aren't left behind so that those kids are struggling. We're making the early interventions before they get too far behind, and then we deal with all the other um, emotional and psychological problems that, that come in that hold kids back um, because they don't have confidence and their self-esteem is, is, is down and we have to deal with all those. So I think it's making sure that we have the resources and programs available, uh, making sure that we are engaged with the families so that the, the parents are engaged. And sometimes I, I understand that that can be very difficult, but it's really taking those extra steps to make sure that, that we are keeping them engaged and involved so that the kids are getting the support that they need. Thank you. Ms. Donahue. So when we talk about accountability and accountability reports, it's often characterized as the districts or schools report cards. Um, and I would uh, offer to all of you uh, the uh, interest of looking at those uh, statistical reports that are uh, on the DPI site as well as uh, on our own school district site. The school district does okay. About 63% of our students meet expectations but we need to put it in the framework of accountability tests and testing. It's been said that uh, you can predict what a child's uh, test score is going to be in a direct relationship with the number of square feet in the, in the student's house. In other words, poor kids have a harder time scoring high on, account, on, on standardized testing than children who are, 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 uh, whose parents do better. Those tests are very important, but they are only a piece of the, of the picture. Um, and uh, so I, from what I have been able to read and to observe and to question, uh, our school district is hyper-focused on making sure not only that the kids do well on tests, but that they're actually learning all of the things that they need to learn to be good citizens in the world. There have been times when the emphasis on testing has been, I would say, almost destructive to learning because the intent of teachers and the fear of students all relates to standardized testing. Important, I am not in any way suggesting that we shouldn't do them, but we need to understand the whole student, what the student is involved in. As Chris is saying, what, where does the student come from? What, what resources does the student have at home? How, what can we do within the context of the school district to involve kids? Just go to the SASD website. It is a wonderland of programming and interests and ways that we challenge and involve our kids and the community and our parents. So um, I think the district, as Mark said, is laser focused. On, on making sure that we meet expectations, but my expectations are a whole lot broader than just what you find on a standardized test. And I think, it's, I think that is the case for the district as well. And, and I think that's the direction we need to go. Thank you. Our next question, and we will start with Mr. Domogolski. What are your views on school vouchers and the proposed expansion of the voucher program being discussed by Wisconsin legislators? And how do you understand the effects of this proposed legislation on future support for public education and on taxpayers across the state? So I would tell you that it's complicated. Um, so that I support parents um, having a choice and the ability to decide what's best for their kids. Um, and so I would say from that point, I'm not against vouchers for private schools. Um, the problem that I have with vouchers is that often if we don't do a good job in the school district, we lose the best kids. Um, 
and that's a bad way to say it. <laughs> um, those with, with the least challenges um, to private schools. And so I believe that the district has done very, very good job compared to other districts about keeping some of those options in the school. And that's really the strength of the district, as I've said before, is that there are options and pathways for everyone. Um, and so as long as we focus on that, I believe that, that we can keep um, enrollment up and keep people engaged in the district and the kids in the district, which, which will bring those public dollars to us. Um, you know, I can just tell you from, from my own experience, um, growing up, I went to Catholic schools. Um, my kids um, started out in, in private schools, but ended up going to public schools in the Milwaukee area. And, and we, when we moved here, um, somebody from the community that I think very highly of even called me up before we moved and said, let me tell you about all the, the private schools and what your options are up here. Um, because that person knew my background of growing up and the fact that I had gone to Catholic schools. And, and I said, well, you know, one of the things that really attracts us to Sheboygan is the strength of the school district. And so that's where we're planning on sending our kids. And um, as I've said, we're very pleased with the education that all of our kids have had. And so I'm not necessarily against vouchers. I support parents having choices. And I believe that it's our responsibility as members of the school board to give parents those choices within the district. And so that's what I would work on doing. Thank you, Ms. Donahue. So the school voucher program started in Milwaukee, expanded to Racine. It is now a statewide program. It currently has income limits. In other words, not all parents are eligible for vouchers. The proposal before the legislature now is to make all parents eligible for vouchers, no matter what their income level. Uh, the problem with school vouchers is, and we need to understand um, that, as Mark said, in, uh, in the last school year, uh, within the Sheboygan Area School District, and I believe there are five or six private schools that enroll uh, voucher students, um, $4.3 million was paid in school vouchers. What we need to understand is that came right off the top of the Sheboygan Area school district's budget. It was not a separate um, expenditure made by the state. So what was, what was given to voucher parents was taken away from public school parents. I agree with Chris that parents should have choice. I went, I grew up in a, in a public, in a private school, which is in a St. Clements, which is why I can write pretty well, and uh, Sister Natalia, my eighth grade nun, um, who just died at 91, but was a friend of mine through life. Um, it was a wonderful education in, in some respects, in other respects, there's a reason I don't do math. Um, I, I fully respect, and, and my parents sent us to, to, to St. Clements, it cost $25 a year, by the way, so that really, you know, it was before the dinosaurs, but not that far before. Um, School vouchers, if we're going to do it, if we're going to give parents money to send their kids to a private, almost always, but not always, religious school, it needs to be a separate expenditure that is separately voted on by the legislature. So that in, in Sheboygan, for example, 44% of the students who are in private schools are receiving school vouchers. If that limit is lifted, I don't know how much more money will be taken away from our school district. We can't afford it. We truly can't. So again, I think we need to speak to our legislators and say, if you want to support private, private schools, that's fine. That you know, Give parents that choice, but it needs to be a separate expenditure. Mr. Mansell. Yeah. Still sorting my thoughts out here, and I may end up surprising some people that actually know me fairly well. I'm, I'm not a big fan of vouchers. Uh, I, I just think inherently there's a problem. I obviously support parents' options and choice to go to a private school, but I just, I, I have a real difficult time taking public funds and shooting them to a, a private sector school. If I don't like the Sheboygan Police Department, 
I want, I want to hire Joe's police service. I want my $5,000 worth of my property taxes to go hire that. That doesn't happen. This seems to be the only public service provided that you can, that people can get their money out and go and take it to a private organization. The other thing that, you know, it hasn't come up yet, but what about the private school that ends up being extremely controversial for whatever reason it might be? And now you're going to be taking public funds and putting it into ideology that might go against everybody's belief system. Uh, I just, I, I, I just have never really been on board with it. I, like I said, if the state wants to come up with a different way of funding it that doesn't impact the funding for the public schools, let them create their their new monster that way. But it shouldn't be at the uh, at the expense of the of uh, funding the public schools. Next question, uh, we'll start with Ms. Donahue. Um, how can the district adapt curricula to reflect the changing needs of the workplace? I think that may be one of your only one part questions. <laughs> and I really appreciate it. Um, the school district is doing some really remarkable uh, uh, programming. Uh, I remember, uh, as parents, we all want to send our kids to college. College is very expensive. Sometimes it leads to a great career path. Sometimes it leads to debt. We need trained and skilled workers who don't necessarily pursue a traditional college route. So what do we do in the school district? Um, the Red Raiders program at both North and South is astonishing. Um, the uh, the cooperation and the involvement of private businesses in our community to fund a and, and to equip really um, uh, laboratories uh, with educational equipment, equipment that kids can use on the job is amazing. Um, the other program which um, I think is, is amazing for information technology is called College Here and Now. So children, students in high school at both North and South can take classes in technology at the high school that count towards an LTC associate's degree. And then when they graduate from college, they can go to Lakeland and complete a bachelor's degree in another two years in information technology. I mean, this, this, the innovation that you see, not only in these two programs, but really just across the district, I think is, is really impressive. Um, so we need to continue to do that and look at different ways of how do we connect what our society's needs are with our students' abilities and inclinations. Um, we need citizens, we need students to be good citizens, but we need them to be able to do, um, to make things and repair things and think about things and make this a better world. So I, I think the school district is on it and I applaud those efforts. Mr. Mansell. I was going to say, it's already happening. Uh, it's referred to commonly as college and career ready. And we've even developed our own report card, which is much more accurate and useful than what the, uh, the state accountability is. And the state is actually moving towards that. Uh, because what we're needed to do, we need to have these kids that are planning on going to college prepared to go to college and be successful in that. So that I think there was you know, years ago, there was too much of a push for just everybody should be going to college. And now we finally recognize that we need to develop a workforce, uh, more of a blue collar force. And we have partnerships with uh, uh, Lakeshore Technical College along with uh, Lakeland University for various programs uh, and developing careers. Uh, we've got certification programs through LTC. We've got kids graduating that are certified welders. We've got uh, CNAs. I wish I had the whole list in front of me, but it's impressive and it's on the website. I'm sure we could find it, but uh, it, is, it is very impressive. And I would, I would think in, I guess, kind of jumping back to that accountability score, not all of our kids are going to college and we can't expect them to be, you know, scoring in the 20s on the, SATs or the ACTs and and uh, exceeding expectations in reading and, and math. I mean, it would be great, 
but we need them to be able to graduate and function. And uh, I guess one of the new things that we're teaching the kids is uh, personal finance now too, which I think is an important factor, not only for, you know, so that they're prepared once they walk out the door. Uh, and one of the things that, go, going back, that uh, we need to be proud of for this district in how we uh, are able to continue to improve and educating our students is our absentee rate is below the state average, which is good because the kids aren't gonna learn if they're not in school. So that's one bonus. And then the second one is how do we, how do we grade ourselves as a district? And that is our graduation rate and our, and our ability to have these graduates prepared for their next step, whether it be college or career or military. Thank you. Mr. Domagoski? Yeah, I think they all hit it right on the head, you know, and it, it's really important that the school district continues to do the things that it's already doing and staying connected with our businesses, with our chamber, with our nonprofits, and offering the things that they do, both um, the, the different pathways. So the pathway programs that we talked about with LTC and Lakeland, um, the Red Raider program, um, the mentoring that goes on, the opportunities to job shadow, um, you know, one of the real... Um, when I look at my kids or even when I look at myself, the kids that are really successful, and it is different for everybody, but those that can really figure out something, the earlier they can figure out what they think they want to do and have that goal really keeps them focused and, and gets them so that they are prepared um, and follow the right path. Um, to, to have a career, and, and I get it, it doesn't work that way for everybody. Some of us, you know, take this circular path where we think we wanna be an accountant and we go to school for a couple of years and figure out, yeah, no, that's not it. Um, and then we take a left turn and try something else until we really figure out what that is. Um, you know, for my youngest son, it's, he, he was tired from school and, and needed a break, and so he, did what Mark said and went into the military and he's in the Marine Corps and now has um, some job skills and some ideas what he wants to do. So he's um, gonna be moving forward that way. And so that break was really helpful. But I, but I think it's having all of those connections um, so that w we are able to equip and give the opportunity for kids to do things like shadow and mentor and have the tools and the programs available so that that they're prepared for the workforce when it gets to be that time. Um, and even, you know, the entrepreneurship is such a big thing. So having the opportunities like they do in Sheboygan with Jake's and the connection now with Lakeland and some of those things, it's really just amazing. And so I think we just need to stay connected and not forget that. Thank you. Uh, we do have a, another forum uh, following this one. So in the interest of time, this is gonna be the last question of the evening for you school board candidates. Uh, and we are gonna start with Mr. Mansell. What would be your key proposals that you would suggest for overall improvement of the Sheboygan Area School District? Well, I, I don't know that I have anything to propose. I, it's always been our priority to continue to improve. And if you take a look at our our uh, five-year, you know, our five-year plan and our quarterly updates on that. Our, it, uh, we every June we have a strat or a June planning session where we come up with the goals and identify what we want to accomplish during this year in the district, and it's broken down into a variety of things. Uh, so I, it's already happening. I guess there's nothing new that I can propose to say that we can make it better. Mr. Domagoski. So my key proposal would be that um, based on the impacts of the uh, pandemic and just the way that society's gone, um, we've lost some, some community. And we really have such an amazing community here with so many um, great resources in that um, that we really double down and try to, to build on that community again and 
create more engagement with parents in the schools. Um, I, I think that's so important, and I don't think that we have the strong PTAs and things that we've had in the past. And so that building community, and the, the key is, uh, you know, the, the schools are really one of the key assets in our neighborhood. So taking advantage of that and using um, our school district really to the greatest advantage that it can be um, to the community. Our, our schools are really uh, a social, um, economic and cultural driver of this community. Um, and so investing more in the community and that connection with the community would be my primary proposal. Thank you, Ms. Donahue. Um, so I, uh, the number one, uh, we need to continue to advocate for more funding for public schools. We need to continue to build a relationship with the folks in Madison. And as Chris said, they need to understand in more significant ways than they appear to at this time that a strong public education system is what powers the state forward. And, and of course, that extends into, into the university system. Um, uh, I believe Mark uh, spoke earlier, I think it was Mark, about the uh, schools that will need to be replaced. We need to be thinking thoughtfully about how we maintain our infrastructure, uh, how we fund it. Um, the school district from a borrowing perspective is in pretty good shape, uh, but borrowing costs are borrowing costs. And, and how do we do that? And, and do we take it to our community to say we need new middle schools? We need to be thinking through where we're gonna be educating our kids. Um, right now, uh, if my understanding from just from attending uh, school board meetings is that the ESSER funding, the, the, the federal funding that has come uh, because of the pandemic is really and truly a lifesaver uh, for the school district in all sorts of ways. But primarily, uh, one of the, the, the larger uses is for recruiting uh, teachers and uh, teaching staff. And how do we maintain those, those teachers? Teaching used to be a a truly rewarding profession. It is still a truly rewarding profession, but I believe it has a whole lot of challenges that, for example, weren't present when my kids were at grant school or at urban. Um, how do we, what is the pipeline that we build to make sure that we have highly qualified, wonderful teachers for our kids, as well as teaching assistants who need to make $20 an hour uh, and, and, and staff? Um, Working on mental health, the, um, the school district uh, through its um, PACE program uh, has connected with Lakeshore <coughs> Community Health Center and other providers to actually provide mental health uh, workers for our students. There's a, in talking to, to the staff there, there's a huge waiting list for these uh, uh, counselors for our, for, because our kids need help need mental health, and so I think that we need to continue to, to work on that pipeline as well, um, and to fashion a vision of what a, our really good school system would look like with healthy, mentally and physically healthy students who are taught by well-paid, engaged, and dedicated staff. We're there in many ways, but I think uh, we've got a whole lot of work to do. Thank you all very much for being here tonight. Uh, we are going to get reorganized and the uh, forum for the county board uh, supervisors candidates is going to follow, I believe, starting at 730. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.